Good evening. Glad you all are here. This evening's lesson is entitled on following the rules. The text comes from Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Titus 3, 1 through 8. Paul says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to, that is, in keeping with and harmony with, his mercy he saved us by the washing of, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace. Crucial. We're justified by his grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now note that Paul specifically says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now consider Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, in which he says, Jesus says, by which, but, but which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to eat. Now, I've never plowed a mule, so I have no idea how much work that is and, and how, much work you, how long you have to plow before you get done. Probably sunrise to sunset, I would imagine. So I, I can't really relate to that. But I understand it's a lot of work. So this guy comes in from the field. He's tired. And will not rather say unto him that just came in from the field, that's got done plowing, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye in comparison of doing all the work and simply doing what you're told to do. When ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. We're unprofitable, we've simply done what our duty was to do. We did what we were told to do. And we're unprofitable servants, we've just done what we were told. We just obeyed. Now note Romans chapter 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, we need to be careful here. He's talking about the law of Moses in contrast to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, Romans 4. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now that's not the question. The question is, when does that happen? When is his faith counted for righteousness? It is, not the argument. The question is, when? When is his faith counted for righteousness? So, when are we justified by faith and our faith counted unto us as righteousness? Now, looking at Romans chapter 6, and, and, and by the way, turn your Bibles to that. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. I, I, I've used this with people, and they are absolutely dumbfounded by it. They, they really have no response. They don't know what to say. Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to, his, to obey... His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, past tense. That's what we were before. Lost my place. But 
ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now watch this. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now question. Now don't raise your hand. I'm, I'm going to answer the question. Okay. Question. When were, there, when were they made free from sin? What does Paul say specifically at the point in which they were made free from sin? They were made free from sin, not the question. The question is when. If you were to put your finger on the place in the sentence where he said they were made free from sin, what, would, what words would be underneath your finger that tells you this is when? Back to verse uh, Back to verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free. There, the then is when they obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered. Up until that point, they were not a son of righteousness. After that point, they did become a, a, a son of righteousness. Question. Don't raise your hand. I'm going to tell you. Question. What was the form of doctrine they delivered? Well, the doctrine, if you're taking notes, is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is the problem I have with the sermon outline. If I, if I don't follow it, we start chasing rabbits. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, just basically, he says it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, that's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You cannot obey that. That's, that's a fact. You cannot obey a fact. You can obey the form of the fact. The form of the fact of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the gospel of Christ, is in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Know ye not, uh, verse, look at verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, remember the death, burial, and resurrection, how that we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's repentance. That's repentance. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ, Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel. The form of that doctrine that you obeyed from the heart is the repentance of sin, the, the burial in the water grave of baptism, being raised, forgiven. It's at that point it's at that point they were made free from sin and became a servant of righteousness. By God's grace. By God's grace. Now, I've asked people that question, and they looked at that, and they had no answer. They had no answer. They had no way to refute that. And, and they, they still were not baptized. The point being is that God has always had rules for which man has been responsible to keep. From the, from, from the afternoon of day six, from the afternoon of day six, or whenever it is that Adam opened up his eyes being a living soul, at that point, there were rules given. No, some pre-flood rules. In the garden, they were told to dress and keep the garden and don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if there are other rules given, we don't have record of it. But we do know that, that they were told to dress and keep the garden and don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There appears to have been, after they left the garden, or, or sometime between then and when they left the garden, rules for worship were given. We see in, in Genesis chapter 4, 3 through 5, that Adam, that Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel brought their gifts. Cain, being a farmer, brought of the vegetables of his garden. Abel, being a, a sheep, uh, a shepherd, uh, brought of the, of the fruit of the flock. Cain's was rejected. Abel's was accepted. Why? Doesn't say. It does not say. There's nothing in that passage that says until you get over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By, by faith, Abel offered a more perfect sacrifice. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God said, this, and we don't have this account, but God apparently, obviously, told them what he wanted. And since Cain didn't bring what God apparently, by inference, by implication, rather, by implication, God told him what to bring, Cain didn't bring it, and God said, sin's at the door. 
Okay. And if you look at Leviticus chapter, we're not going to do it, but just by reference, Leviticus chapter 10, Cain, uh, not Cain and Abel, Nadab and Abihu, I guess they're children, <laughs> Nadab and Abihu, were burnt with fire because they offered incense that was, that, 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 that was fired up, that was lit by coals from an unauthorized fire. Now, I, I researched this quite extensively, and I could not find a reference that said, oh, by the way, use this, use the coals off of this fire, and not, and not, I didn't find that reference. But the implication is there. Because God's not going to strike you dead if you don't know what you're doing. At least not, not as far as I can tell. So they were told somewhere not to use strange fire. And strange fire is anything other than off the altar. And fire came out from the Lord and burned them up. Now, he says, that's kind of harsh. Well, God is serious. I, I, do you get the point that God is serious about what he wants us to do? It's, it doesn't, again, my, just my impression. My impression. He's pretty serious about it. And then there's general righteous living in Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 5. It just, the, the thoughts of their hearts were evil continually. You imagine what that world was like? You imagine living there? You never know who's going to do what to you and when and how they're going to do it and why they're going to do it. Well, I just felt like it. He was just standing there, and I, I just felt like it. All right. Now, if you look, if you, we're, not, we're not looking at it, but if you look down at Genesis 6 and verse 8, it says that Noah found grace in God's sight. Well, how's that work? How is it that these folks are doing evil and old Noah over here found grace in God's sight? How does that work? Show me, book, chapter, and verse, that God said, all that stuff you're doing is evil. And find me, book, chapter, and verse, that all the stuff that Noah's doing would cause him to, be, to find grace in God's sight. I can't find it. The implication is it's that God had told them what he wanted. Somewhere down the line, they were told what to do and what to leave alone. Of that tree, don't eat, but everything else you can eat, eat on. Okay? Now, looking at the rest of Scripture, Romans chapter 5 and verse 13, for, for until, the, until the law, now he's referring specifically to, specifically to the law of Moses in the book of Romans. But the lesson applies, for until the law, sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So the implication is, and the inference that I think is appropriate, is that God had said, all this stuff over here, all this stuff over here is evil, don't do it, and they sucked it up. They went after it with both hands, Gen from Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 5. But Noah said, you know what, We're not, m me and my house are not going to do that. We're going to do this stuff over here that God told us to do. We're going to leave the rest of that stuff alone. Y'all do what you want to do, but we're doing this over here. Now, notice secondly then, that God's blessings have always been contingent. They're always based on one, they're always based on something. If you want my blessings, do this. Now, in, De in Deuteronomy 28, and it shall come to pass, if, a, con a statement of condition, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all the commandments which I command thee this day, that, or then, if you will, but it says that, the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now, if you drop, and, and, and he lists a series of blessings that will accrue to the obedient. You look at verse 15. Well, and, all right. But it shall come to pass if a condition statement. Thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I, which I command thee this day, that, or then, if then statement, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, if you read verse 16 through 68, there is so much hate and discontent, trial, tribulation, and woe that he rained down on their parade, it would take them a month of Sabbath to begin to enjoy that thing. I mean, well, I read it, and look what happened to me. Okay, just take the curl out of my hair. And, and it's all conditioned on obedience or disobedience. Now, how bright do you have to be to figure out that doing this over here is a better deal than doing this stuff over here? Now, think of all the diseases and, 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 and situations that 
just the people in this congregation right now have had over the years that we've had to go get operations for, lay up in a bed after we drop a 40-pound jack. Don't drop a 40-pound jack on your foot. It's not pleasant. Charles will tell you about that. And all the other trials and tribulations we've had and we've had treatment for, and those folks didn't. I, I was thinking about this. You know, I've had kidney stones. Man, there's a shot that they give you, a trope of something or other. It's magic. You, about 15 minutes, you think, hey, I've got this. And the nurse says, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Just wait. Give it another 45 minutes. All right. All right. And, and they didn't have that stuff. And God says, listen, I won't put any of that on you. Matter of fact, you, you won't even lose a calf. You, you folks will do pretty good. And they couldn't handle it. They just couldn't handle it. To receive God's promised blessings, they had to obey. There's no get around that. There's no, you, to deny that is to simply be irrational. And we ought to wrap you up in a wet sheet and put you away someplace. Because that's just, how can you read those words and get anything out of that other than let's just be obedient and leave off the rest of that nasty stuff. So they lived in Egypt. They saw what those people did. The blessings of rest promised by Jesus comes only to those that come to him on his terms. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What are the conditions of receiving the rest? Coming to Jesus, taking his yoke, and learning of him. That's the condition. Do you want the rest? Come over here where it is and do what I tell you to do. Now, why is, how is that misunderstood? How is that? Well, I don't think we have to do that. You're an Israelite then. I, without putting too many beans on that, you're an Israelite that just didn't get it or just ignored it. Um, and, and, and this afternoon, again, I, have to, I, I can't look at an outline once I put it away. I'll start putting more stuff on it. Write down Hebrews, uh, out next to Matthew 11, 28, 30. Write down Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Hebrews 3, I think that's verse 17. It may be verse 19. I can't read my Bible. There are people that didn't enter into the rest God promised because of a heart, an evil heart, an evil heart of disbelief, of unbelief. Well, I don't have to do that. Okay. Get ready. Buckle up. Here it comes. And there's people like that today. Now, notice this. Jesus saves only the obedient. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Or is condemned already, depending on translation. The he that shall be saved. Again, I, hold, open up your Bible and hold that out to your friend, neighbor, relative. And have them read that out loud to you. And say, listen, just read these words. And just looking at those words, tell me what those words mean in their common everyday understanding. If you were to read those words in a newspaper, what would you think they meant? Oh. And they read it to you. Okay. And they say, and then you ask the question, who is the he that shall be saved? He that believes in is baptized. But they'll, they'll tack that on there like that. But notice this. The believer will be baptized and will be saved. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all those that do what? Obey him. Well, I don't think you have to be baptized. Then he's not the author of your, then you don't have eternal salvation and you're lost. Well, I don't believe that. Doesn't change the fact of it. The rock of Gibraltar, here it is. The rock of Gibraltar does not believe in the law of gravity. But somehow, it doesn't float away. Because a person does not believe in the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus needs to be obeyed to have eternal salvation doesn't change the fact of the necessity for obedience. Oh, you believe in works. Well, yeah. We're going to cover that. Again, I, it's, it's beyond me. Okay. So, by what are we saved, and when does that happen? You need to ask your friends, your religious friends, and, and if you're listening to this on the Internet now, or you see this later on, here's the challenge for you. I want you to get out a piece of paper and write down when you are saved. And if you can come down with the month, day, year, and the hour, and the place, write that down, and then I want you to tell me how you know you were saved. And I want you to give me book, chapter, and verse. It's a challenge. I had a friend of mine years ago that we were having this discussion. And I said, John, I said, I can prove I'm saved and you can't. He just pushed me too far. And I didn't know you weren't supposed to be tactful back then. 
<laughs> and I quoted, but here, believe it, and I quoted that to him. I said, and you, you can't tell me when you were saved. And you can't quote book, chapter, and verse. And he never did. He never did. Now, Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Herod, and her name was Elizabeth. Notice this. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, are you telling me, preacher, that they never sinned? Absolutely not. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. No question about that. And we'll look at another passage here in Psalms 14 that, that buttresses that, that statement. But the fact is, when they did transgress the law, what did they do immediately, if not sooner? They offered a sin sacrifice to cover it. Okay. And in that consequence, they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, Genesis 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, if there wasn't a standard by which to judge righteousness and unrighteousness, that statement is nonsensical. It means nothing. Nothing. But if there was a standard of right and wrong, of righteousness and unrighteousness, and this means then this, there's so much meaning packed into this sentence, we don't have time tonight to discuss it. And there are people out there that just deny that you can know what you have to do to be saved. Or, or they have some off-the-wall idea of what it is. By what we are saved is crystal clear. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the grace, not the faith. It, the grace, is the gift of God. Grace is a gift, an unmerited gift, unmerited favor. We don't deserve salvation. We've done all those things commanded to say we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. God doesn't have to save the sinner, but by God's grace, he does. And aren't we all glad about that? Not of works, lest any man should boast. I can't earn my way. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. Question, rhetorical question. Which work of God that he's commanded us to walk therein can we leave off and still go to heaven? Be careful. Be very, very careful. In the, in the words of a wise man, be very, very, very careful. Just, just be careful. Because you're, 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 you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all mankind, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I've heard people say that the law of Moses had no grace, and that's just not true. How did they know which sacrifices to offer for a sin. Well, God told them. There you go. If you do this sin, here's the sacrifice for it. That's God's grace. When, new, when that person sinned, God could have just said, you're done. But he didn't. Why? Gracious God. Aren't we glad for that? If not, you should be. Now, such is the case that there are no righteous persons. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, how do you misunderstand that? There is, no, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after to God. That's not hard to understand, I would think. Now, notice Psalms 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Man, we have no hope. <laughs> if that's all there was to it, if we didn't have anything else other than that, boy, howdy. That would be just absolutely depressing. So, how do we then find grace in a sight? 
Now, you, you can't make it up. You can't just wing it. You can't just make an altar to the unknown God and expect that whatever you do to be acceptable. So what do you do? Paul is clear by obedience. Again, we're going back to Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18. We obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered, being then made free. We became the servants of righteousness. But until you obey the form of doctrine, you will not, cannot become a, a servant of righteousness. It's not possible. If it is, you are obligated to provide book, chapter, and verse. Well, we don't believe in that. Well, you probably should. You need to repent is what you need to do. Now, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. He says, seeing you have purified your souls. <gasps> How'd they do that? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. The Spirit revealed the truth to the apostles and those he, other prophets he inspired. And they wrote it down. They spoke it. So people knew what to do. Until Moses had been told what the law, what the law would be, nobody knew. Until the apostles and the prophets in, the, in the, what we call New Testament time had been inspired to know what to say and write down, nobody knew and could not know until God revealed it. It was a mystery. It was unrevealed information. Obeying the truth through the Spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Kind of reminds you of John chapter 3, 3 through 5, which we're getting to next. God, I got it, glad I have it written down. We are not saved by the things. Just because I do the things doesn't save me. The things that I've been commanded to do don't save me. I find no book, chapter, and verse anywhere in the Bible, take it in context, that teaches that the things, just doing the things, will save me. I, I, can I make that any clearer? Can I, if I wrote that down on an English paper in your class, would you give? Would you say, "Well, you didn't clear, you didn't write it clear enough, Gene"? Okay, Miss Parker, help me out. Okay, I have to go to my English teacher and get some help on that thing. So, what do we do? Only those. Uh, uh, by, we are not saved by the things we do in obedience to God's commands, but rather God saves by grace those, only those, and all of those who submit to his will. God cannot, his character will not allow him to save the disobedient. How can you say that? Because I find no book, chapter, and verse that says otherwise, and I find every book, chapter, and verse that says that's the case. Hebrews 5, 9, he's the author of eternal salvation to who? With just anybody willy-nilly walking down the street? Those that obey him. And that's pretty straightforward. I don't know how you misunderstand that. Jesus, John 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, if and only if, a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Without that, you're not going to see the kingdom. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and he be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, if and only if, a man be born of water and of the Spirit, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I don't believe you have to be baptized. You're not going to enter the kingdom of God. It's just that simple. Acts 2 and verse 37. 14 through 36, Peter and the other apostles convicted the Jews of murdering the Messiah. And they got that. They were probably witnesses. Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were picked in their hearts. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto him, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, that's me and you, even as many as the Lord our God shall call by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, and with many other words that he testified and exhorts, saying, Save yourselves. But we can't save ourselves by ourselves, on our own. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Notice this. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They entered the kingdom because they were born of water into the Spirit, and they saw the kingdom. 
They were added to it. They were put into it. How do I know that? The same day, they read unto them about 3,000 souls, praising God and having favor with the people. Verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You go back to verse 41 to find out who the, those who were being saved were. Again, it, I don't know. I, I don't know how you misunderstand that. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, and now why tarriest thou, Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And no, we don't believe in water salvation. Matter of fact, we detest the idea of water salvation. I preach against it every chance I get. Whenever I speak about it, I'm against it. It's not the water, it's the blood. Ephesians 5 and 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Being born again. And again, we go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23, Luke 17 and verse 10. Jesus said, so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. It's my duty to obey from the heart the form of doctrine delivered in order to become a servant of righteousness. Galatians 5 and verse 6, for, Jesus Christ neither, for, in, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith that works by love. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We love him because he first loved us. How do you misunderstand that? That's just simply beyond me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. If you ask me, well, I want an explanation. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. If you find an honest heart, that would just simply read the words out loud and do what those words say to do. They will be what the words will lead them to become, children of God, with unfeigned love of the brethren. Why would we do what God commands us to do? First John says, this, and this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. We love him, John says, because he first loved us. I think that's verse 10. First uh, John 4 and verse, I think it's verse 10, the following verse. Why would we continue doing what God commands? Once I've done that, why would I keep on? For the hope which laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, Colossians 1 and verse 5. Man, I tell you what, I have, I have never thought so much about heaven until I have in recent weeks. I've never thought about my own personal condition, about those round about me as I have in these last number of weeks. None of us have tomorrow. None of us have tomorrow. We've got right now. Paul says today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. And there are so many people that are dying every moment of every day that have never heard the gospel or that have heard it and turned aside from it. And that's the tragedy. That's the absolute tragedy. You try to get people to sit down and study with you to discuss it, and they're not interested. They've got, they're too busy. They're too busy. But on the day of judgment, they'll have all the time. Well, the, how do you talk about a time and a place when there is no time and place? How do you describe a yellow to a blind man? I don't know. But there, there'll be a time and a place, forgive me, where we will have eternity to either enjoy the fruits of our labor or regret that we never sowed the seed for a harvest. If you're not a child of God, become one. If you are but you've been unfaithful, come back. If you need our prayers, let us pray for you. If you have questions, and I really hope I've stirred the pot on that one so that when people read this or hear this, rather hear this later on, they'll do something about it. They'll seek out the truth, and that's all we're interested in. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while together we stand.